Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I would like to begin today with something that is not an explanation. It's rather some history, and not even the history of ideas starting from the Buddha, but the history of these stepping stones from one shore to the other, from suffering to enlightenment, from duality to non-duality. Long time ago, Buddha Shakyamuni sat on Vulture Peak. This was a very famous mountain in northern India. And he was going to begin the Dharma speech, but he did not speak for a long time. After a while, he raised the flower. Then one of his students, Mahakashyapa, smiled. Then the Buddha spoke. I have the true Dharma, which I now transmit to Mahakashyapa. Nobody understood. First, why did the Buddha pick up a flower? Second, why did Mahakashyapa smile? Third, what kind of Dharma was transmitted from the Buddha to Mahakashyapa? This is the beginning of Zen. This is the beginning of a mind-to-mind -mind transmission independent of words and speech. In the Buddha's time, there was another important occasion where this was displayed. Mahakashyapa was actually a young monk. He was an old person and he had been practicing yoga for decades. He was actually an accomplished yogi, but he was a very young monk. And in Buddhist society to the present day, Monks and nuns sit in accordance with their monk age. Elder monks first, younger monks last. So he was a young monk. But when he entered the teaching space where Shakyamuni was sitting, he started to approach the front as if he had been an old monk. And you could sense the consternation in the Sangha. But as he was approaching the Buddha himself, the Buddha moved over a little bit on his seat, leaving some space next to him. Mahakashyapa sat down and they kept sitting for a while together. So this was an important demonstration of Buddha nature. That just like the Buddha can get enlightenment, so can his successors get enlightenment. And this kind of equality is only about Buddha nature. This is not about your karma. This is not the modern idea of equality in society. There was an important figure in China. We jump 28 plus 6 generations, over a thousand years in history. Now I speak about Hui Neng, the sixth patriarch. And he was an illiterate person. And uh, he lost his father and supported his mother by getting firewood and selling it at the local market. And one day, he heard a monk reciting the Diamond Sutra, that you should understand the nature of this world as illusion, as a speck of dust, as a bubble in the stream. When he hears this line, he gets enlightenment. And then he asks the monk, Elder brother, where do you come from? Which monastery do you study at? And the monk, in turn, pointed to the monastery, and Hui Neng enters the monastery as an apprentice in Korean Hengja. Not yet a monk, but no longer a layperson. And as most Hengjas, he begins with hard work, physical work. And he is pounding rice to prepare it for cooking. And in the workshop where he was working, there were these wooden railings. And uh, this plays an important part later. And so it happened at that time that the fifth patriarch launched a contest. And he said to all the monks, demonstrate your dharma to me by writing a poem on this main wall of the monastery. And the best poem gets transmission. So everybody believed that Shen Xiu, the great head monk, will be the winner. So everybody kind of backed out. Nobody wanted to seem too ambitious. 
So the head monk writes his poem, beautiful four-liner on the monastery wall, and he says, the body is Bodhi tree, the mind is the clear mirror's stand, always clean, 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 never let dust settle. So I can see it in your eyes that you like this poem. This is a good poem. And in fact, it was so good that everybody was adoring it even about a thousand years ago or more. Hui Neng, who was just a hangja at that time, he asks one of the monks, Elder Brother, please, could you read me this poem? Because I cannot read and write. I'm from a very poor family. I would like to know what it says. So he learns about the poem line by line, and he says, Ah, oh, I heard about this competition. Elder Brother, can I ask you to help me write my response to this poem on the wall? And then the monk looked at him, what? You're not even a monk. You are just pounding rice for the last couple of weeks. What are you thinking? What can you get? So, Huineng says, I understand. I'm very young. But I'm asking you to please help me enter this contest. And if I'm defeated, I'll take it as a great teaching for my future monkhood. OK, so what do you want? Bodhi has no tree. Clear mirror has no stand. Originally nothing. Where is dust? Now, you look a little bit like those monks in the monastery, very surprised. Very, very surprised. How can this be Zen at all? This doesn't have anything. It has no bodhi, which is enlightenment. It has no clear mirror. It has nothing positive, like clean, 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 clean. Everybody wants positive concepts, okay? Optimism, outlook, etc. Never let dust settle. This is a very good advice, like to a child in the kindergarten. So don't touch the fire because it will burn you, okay? Be a good child. So Hui Neng actually did a huge favor for us because he just went back working to the rice mill. And the fifth patriarch saw it. He grabs his own shoe and clears off Hui Nang's poem from the wall and says, this is garbage. This is no good. But he didn't say anything about the head monk's poem. He goes to the rice mill and with his stick, he hits that wooden railing three times by putting his hand behind his back. He doesn't even look at Hui Neng, just hits it. And this meant that the third hour after sundown, please come to my room, through the back exit, not the front. So it's about midnight and Hui Neng goes to the fifth patriarch's room and he receives a secret transmission. And the fifth patriarch says, you should escape. These monks will not tolerate you. Leave. And when the time comes, you'll find the appropriate place in the appropriate monastery. You will be ordained and you will accede to the position of the sixth patriarch. And here is my transmission to you. Now at that time, the Buddha's ball Shakyamuni Buddha's begging ball and his kasa were still part and parcel like a material proof of Dharma transmission. So Huinan gets these relics and he escapes. Sunrise, morning practice, breakfast, work period, <laughs> nothing happens. Everybody was waiting for the great announcement about transmission to the head monk. No such thing ever happened. The fifth patriarch did not show himself. So those monks were not stupid. They really figured out what was going on because the hengja was missing. The fifth patriarch doesn't show. So some of those monks were actually ex-military because it was fashionable in China that once you finished your military service, you were 50, 55, and if you didn't want a family, and you were Buddhist as most people of those times, you may have wanted to enter a monastery 
to spend the rest of your life in contemplation and in respect because everybody knew who you were before becoming a monk. The ex-military immediately found out. He was a general before. He spent like 30 years doing his job. He just found out where he went, which direction, and in a day he caught up with them. The ex-military monk sees that, ah, oh, he's right there. Hui Neng also looked back to, oops, I will be caught. So what should I do? So he puts the Buddha's ball and robe onto a huge rock, and he hides behind the rock. The ex-military catches up with him, tries to move the objects, but the objects reportedly didn't move from the rock. So at that time, he was really waiting for the sixth patriarch to appear. He was even scared what happened because he couldn't move the objects. He says, younger brother, I mean no harm to you. Please come show yourself. So the sixth patriarch takes a huge breath, gathers his self-confidence, and comes out of his hiding place and says, if you want these objects, I can give them to you. Then the pursuer says, I did not come here for the robe and the bowl. I came here for the Dharma. Please teach me, younger brother. So then the sixth patriarch says, when you do not think of good and bad, what is your original face? The pursuer heard it and got enlightenment. He puts his hand in a very respectful hopchang position and says, younger brother, please, if there's any more secret teaching from the fifth patriarch, reveal it to me. I would like to be your student. Then Hu Yang says, if you have this mind, we are already, you and me, the students of the fifth patriarch. What I have said to you is full and complete. There is no more secret teaching. Even this is as obvious as the blue sky and the unmoving mountains. So then they parted ways. And Hui Nang was uh, in hiding for 17 years. And after 17 years, he actually got the name Hui Nang and formally the position of the Sixth Patriarch. <clears throat> and from him, we have multiple transmissions because later he broke the Buddha's bowl and tore up the kasa, the ceremonial robe, into pieces and burned them. And he says, nobody ever should be heard because of these material objects, because some people can get attached to them. And from Hui Neng's time, we have multiple transmission lines until it, then it was monolinear, just one line. So since then, we have five schools, and the five schools again multiplied into several others, one of which is my order, the Korean Buddhist Chogya order. <coughs> the Chogya, as a name, is the very mountain where the sixth patriarch was living and practicing as a monk. You can still see it in China, it's in Guangzhou in the south, and the place, the temple is called Nam Wasa. I have been there. And I could see the very place where he was teaching for many decades. And Korean Buddhism specifically carries the sixth patriarch's original question, when you do not think of good and bad, what is your original face, in a shortened form. And we call that Huadu, the origin of phenomena. In short, what is this? So not just what is your true face, not when you don't think of good and bad, what is your true face, but what is this? So what is this clear mirror mind which has no stand? What is this state of mind which has originally nothing? So Hua means actually the phenomena, and Du is head, the origin. And Hua Du has been practiced in Korean Zen for like 1300 years. And this is important that this question went straight up to the mountains and until the 1960s, it did not come down. It did not mix with lay society. And this clear mind is the basis for any solution for the Kongans, those controversial and paradoxical stories of which you heard two before the Sixth Patriarch story. Do you remember that? 
Do you remember the Buddha's flower transmission? Do you remember how he gave seed to Mahakashyapa, demonstrating the equality of our Buddha nature? These are kongans that cannot be solved by rational thinking or emotional patterns. Rather, these are paradoxes, just like the paradoxes we carry in our subconscious, sometimes in our conscious self too, that are very energetic. And depending on the direction you give to these paradoxes, these unresolved opposites, your life goes up, steady, or down. As Zen Master Pai Chang from the same period in China as the Sixth Patriarch, he said, watch where you step. Clouds float up to the heavens, the rivers flow down to the sea. Anybody has any questions? Thank you for coming here. Uh, I want to ask, uh, why did he have to go in being monk? He got the enlightenment and had to go in, in the temple. Those times in China and until recently everywhere in Asia, it was impossible to practice meditation without becoming a monk or a nun. Life was so tough without any of the infrastructure that we know today that uh, if you wanted to practice, you have to completely leave your family and lay life because you had such social obligation both in the Indian cultural sphere and in the Chinese cultural sphere, which included way more countries than these two. There were many ways to formulate social ethics, but if you stayed a layperson, man or woman, then you had obligations that you had to fulfill. You had to get married, to get a job, you have to have children, respect and support your elders. But he had to become a monk. If he didn't, his enlightenment would not have been brought to the surface and he couldn't have practiced. So it's not just important to attain this point. You have to work it out. You have to bring it to the surface. You have to make this functional. This is just substance. You have to practice to perceive truth in light of this substance and then correctly function based on that truth. So in Zen Master Sung San's teaching, these are the three most important underpinnings of Zen practice. Attain substance, clear like space, clear like a mirror. Perceive truth, the sky is blue, the trees are green, it's dark outside, it's bright inside and do correct function. When you are thirsty, drink. When someone else is thirsty, give them water. So this is correct function. And if you don't practice, you can't get out of substance even if you really got it. This is what we call enlightenment sickness. Practitioners get that too. If they practice too many years up in the hermitage or in the monastery with just a close circle of Zen monks, and if they do that, then they can get attached to samadhi or to the sweetness of this enlightened mind. Um, lay people, they have to translate that into everyday life, and that's why we are teaching outside, that's why we have Zen groups, that's why we teach meditation, so that you could make your substance function in everyday life as a lay person. And that takes some skills, both to teach and to acquire, because the majority of society, they do not seem to follow enlightened principles. That's why we look like this. So to put that direction into this everyday life, that takes some courage, faith, and keeping the great question. What is yes. this? What do you mean by substance? You mean the organic existence level? When you hear the sound, there is no thinking. That mind which has no thinking becomes one with the universe and then your substance, the universe's substance, become one. If you keep thinking, if you make I, if you build a wall of yourself, your substance, the universe's substance are separate. So to attain this substance which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, you have to cut off thinking and become one. No name, no form, no good, no bad, no life, no death, no coming, no going. We cannot tell you what this is. 
but you can experience this if you follow the right direction and the right practice. And this clear like space, clear like mirror mind reflects this universe very clearly right at this moment. So the clearer this original mind is, the clearer the reflection is, and the clearer then the function is. How do you know that you are on the right way? Your teacher helps. That's not enough. Teacher is just one part of the equation. Next, you see by your own self, with your own eyes and your own ears, you can perceive whether you make more mistakes or less, whether you cause more suffering or less. Are you happier than before or not? Can you make other people happy or not? So you can see it for yourself. But at first, our minds are not so clear. And that's why the teacher needs to help you. In Zen, the teacher is not a guru. He or she does not appropriate your person and does not take your freedom and responsibility. We love to give our responsibility to somebody who we look upon as a teacher. But what we don't realize is that we also give our freedom away. So in Mahayana, we do not take the student's freedom slash responsibility away. Why? Because that would be the denial of your own Buddha nature, your own capacity to wake up. So a good Zen teacher actually allows you to make mistakes and then stands by that if you scream, then there would be somebody to ask, okay, so now how may I help you? If you didn't listen so far, no problem. But now you banged your head just against the wall and you're bleeding. Would you like some help? So that's actually the correct way of teaching. Because Zen doesn't treat you like a sheep or a child or somebody incompetent or missing something. We just have karma to work off. And that's why we practice together. So this together practicing involves the teacher, the teaching, and the other students together. These are the three important parts of the tradition, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So that's the way it works. And that's how you can see on multiple fronts whether you are going to the right direction or to the wrong one. The values of right and wrong became really absolute in the West. And that's why we suffer, because they were written down in books this thick. All of the titles say, I am the only one, the only book that is right. And we have at least three major versions here. And also smaller versions within the big ones. And if any of these books would be right, all the others would go to hell. Isn't that a little bit odd? That's why in Buddhism we don't touch this problem. We go to the mind that believes or doesn't believe, that sees clearly or does not see clearly, that creates suffering or creates happiness. We want to attain that mind. We want to get back to our original true nature. And from there, act correctly, speak correctly, think correctly, have correct emotions. And then our situation, relationship, and function are all clear. Okay? So that's how you know whether the direction is correct or not. More questions? Thank you for coming. And my question is, uh, what is your approach to healing? How do we heal ourselves both uh, emotional and or physical? The original Zen tradition did not explicitly go into physical healing. Why? Um, because when you practice meditation, your energy level naturally increases. Zen means do not make anything, do not make any dualities, do not make the concepts of suffering, enlightenment, good and bad, me and other. Don't have your mind spin around these things. Completely put them down. So. When you do not make these things, and you do not want things outside, and you do not have any attachments, then naturally your energy level increases because you don't divide it into several small pieces. You don't start to turn these pieces against one another. Conflicting emotions, conflicting thoughts, etc., etc. So when you do not have this waste of energy, then your energy level, both mentally and physically, increase. And that naturally activates within limits the self-cleansing capability of the mind and the self-healing capability of the body. So I emphasize within limits because this is not a crash course for super healing or magic or what kind of stuff, you know? 
Nothing like that. But if you meditate correctly, your mind can actually heal all the wounds that you made within yourself. It's possible. But this is not a promise. It's a potential that you may use if you practice right. Okay? If your body is sick, see a doctor. You get an accident, go to the hospital. We don't deal with that in Zen practice because it would divert attention towards the physical. And uh, you should put Zen to the right place. Zen Master Sung San uh, was a very famous and truly enlightened Zen Master. And in uh, America, in the 80s, he, his heart was already developing problems because of his former diabetes. He goes to the hospital and the doctors actually knew who he was. So they asked him, Sir, we know you are Zen Master. We know you have some powers. Why don't you fix your heart yourself? Why do you come to us? And Sung San Sunim said, yeah, if I went to the mountains for a hundred days, I could fix my heart. So then the doctor said, so why don't you do that? Then come down, teach us how to do this, okay? Why not? Then Sung San Sunim says, I don't do this kind of practice because it would not be correct teaching. End of story. And I can see it in your eyes. Why not correct teaching? This is wonderful. This is fantastic. No, it's not. It's a limited view because you focus on the body, which after 60, 70, 80 years anyway goes to the garbage. Why don't you focus on the mind, which carries hundreds of lifetimes of karma? Why don't you focus on the heart that actually makes all your emotions or the mind that makes all your thinking? Why don't you focus on everything that's your real homework in your soul that takes a clear mind to finish rather than the body that would feel good? and then feel bad, and feel good, and then feel even worse, and after these ups and downs, gone. In monastic life, you have a duty to keep your body healthy, but not for yourself, for your practice, so that you could practice as long as you can, and help others as long as you can, and then go when the time comes, when you finish your job in this incarnation. So neither super healthy, nor terribly sick, because if you are terribly sick, you are at the mercy of others then you are the problem, you are not the solution. Very few people attained what Sung San Sunim did, that even with his sickness, he could teach. So that's why we do not focus on the body, it's short term. Focus on the mind, that's long term. That's why we focus on that, because you leave the body here, but you take everything in your storehouse consciousness and discriminative consciousness together with you, what we call the soul. Right. Okay, you mention a lot the right practice, but how do you know when you practice correctly? First of all, you don't practice just for yourself, you practice for all beings. That's why we have the four great bodhisattva vows that we recite at the end of uh, every practice session. And that puts our di direction very clear, that our practice is going to the right place. And as I I've said earlier, you know when your practice is right, when you make less mistakes, you create less suffering, you're more harmonious, you have to think less, you have to have less emotional confusion. That's how you feel it. It's not just quiet. Quiet is a different concept. You're not always quiet. We are human beings, we have ups and downs. But these ups and downs actually got smaller and more natural. So when you can enter any situation, when you can process any kind of relationship, and when you can perform any kind of function, then you know that your mind has no limits and no walls. Okay? Then your practice is going the right direction. So less suffering means more happiness. We don't begin with happiness. And we don't begin with love and compassion and all these wonderful concepts, because largely we would misunderstand them. If you don't put the new wine into new barrels, the wine is spoiled and the barrels are broken. Familiar? That's why if the mind is not clear that any kind of teaching that enters the mind as a positive, great, optimistic, whatever teaching, is totally spoiled by your own unfinished karma. 
In the Orient, they say, do not mix rice and sand together. So that's why, take away the sand and the rice remains there by itself. Take away suffering and happiness shows itself very naturally. That's why we don't define happiness. Or you already know what that is. But why can't we attain that and keep that? Because we have our unfinished karma, like backseat drivers that control us. And if we follow that, we follow just some routines and habits and false identities that will lead us and others into suffering. So take away that suffering and happiness appear by itself, okay? That's how you know that practice is going the right nice way. Nice to meet you again. Um, my question is, uh, how long is the time between uh, death and rebirth? If we can... How long would you like to stay up there? <laughs> you want to take a holiday? Yeah. <laughs> so then it's very long. Well, let me inform you. Up there, there is no linear time because there is no human body. There is no brain that measures, you know, the time by the ticking of your thoughts or the clouds of your emotions. Good emotions, good thinking, good times passes very quickly. Bad thinking. Bad emotions, bad situations seems to last for eternity, okay? People were writing big books about it, from Marcel Proust to the existentialists, you know, it's huge. But time and space are relative. In fact, they are created by our minds, how you feel space and time. So up there, there is no time and there is no three-dimensional space. So what exactly are you asking about? Thank you. How do we notice what is our karma and how do we clean it up? What color is this stick? Tell me. A straight answer. Yeah. I'm an artist. I would say two or three colors. I don't care whether you're an artist or a teacher or just a cleaning lady. Tell me what you see. Good. Beige, whatever. Ochre. Yeah. Slightly beige, yeah. light brown, etc. So can you see your karma with the same clarity inside? I know you're an artist, but make it simple, please. Artist doesn't mean you have to be complicated and out of this world. Sometimes we all feel like that. So when you practice, your mind becomes simple and clear. You stay in the moment, keep your eyes open, watch your breath, ask the right question or keep the right mantra. And then, slowly, slowly, it happens. And when you believe that you're really wonderfully clear, come to a Kongan interview. Then we check it. More questions? Something puzzles me for a long time about the Buddha. When he left his body, okay, then uh, I know this, this question is not very correct, but uh, I was thinking <laughs> I need this uh, to feed uh, where is the Buddha now? Because I learned that he never got rebirth again. We, we don't know that. In fact, I can see about 45 Buddhas right in front of me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you. About karma, uh, is it, isn't it that in the present moment, actually, we... We, can, we can't really talk about karma. Is karma connected with time, meaning like past and present, and when you're in the present moment, you, you don't identify with any of this? What makes you say that we cannot talk about karma f at this present moment? It kind of puts my whole 16 years of teaching into doubt. <laughs> I mean, being more and more present, um, being this presence, uh, kind of, the patterns of the mind um, dissolve. Maybe. You have a degree in psychology? Or you study that? No. That's exactly how it sounds. Because it's supremely clever, intelligent, but very theoretical. So let me just ask you, when you attain this moment, what happens? Do you take all karma away? No. So then we can actually talk about karma at this moment. Can we? Yeah. Fantastic. Now, I take a deep breath and we continue. But if you attain this moment, something important happens, and I think that's why you asked the question. Because then you attain control over your karma. So you attain this moment, you can control this karma. 
You lose this moment, your karma controls you. Everybody can see this. When you're in a mild shock or a strong shock, then whatever habits you have puts you onto autopilot. And when you attain moment, you attain mind space and mind mirror. You can always reflect. How you are like an observer and you can see all these patterns. Like Not only said. that. Observer is the first thing. Then observe while acting, observe while speaking, observe while thinking and feeling. That's the next one. The observer status in Chinese is called Wu Wei. In Korean, Mu Wei. That means non-acting, not moving, not making duality. So the clearer this observer is, the better your perception is of your own karma. And for that, you have to attain the moment, this unmoving, clear mind, this clear mirror. And then you do not stay at the happy, heavenly observation status because you're a human being and you have to act. You have to speak, you have to feel, you have to think. So then all these four major channels are clear because your observation does not stop and it's not breaking because you don't identify yourself with your karma. You do not become attached to it. So this is really important because correct relationship to your karma is actually our savior. In this body, we always have karma. Karma is not guilt. Karma is not fate. Karma is not something immutable or bad. Karma is something we have accumulated and carry with us like a backpack. But if you identify with the backpack, you can never put it down. You think it's you. And once you realize, oops, these are the straps. You know, these are the bolts. You know, just, let's just undo the clips and then put the backpack down. Let's unpack it. Let's take something out. Let's put something in. And then put it up again. Take it on again. So then, this is the way to handle karma. More questions? Um, my second question is, um, at once, I think, in, a, in a Solonog, did you spoken about dreams, dreams that we can uh, remember? And you, spoken, uh, you spoke about dreams that we remember and we not remember. And you said that dreams we remember, they have a code about our karma, our life, and such a thing is correct. I should admit, yes, it was me. <laughs> I did speak about it. It was in Solnok, and um, guilty as charged. So the question so? is, uh, how can we decode this, and how can we observe these You have uh, dreams? Codes? You have dreams? Yeah. Do you remember them? Yeah. Why? Because they are so like the real life. So I, like I live in this dream. Like uh, um, you tell about um, a monk that dreams about himself. And okay. So what would you like to know about dreams? Uh, what the code is in there? Why need I? I remember it and and I think about it should be a code. Well, look, dreams do not have anything inherent as a super deep structure, like a code about them. But your relationship to the dream depends on your previous karma, where that dream came from. For instance, if you eat a lot of noodles for dinner, you have very special dreams, like this big bull, you know, hunting you down, and you are walking in tar. You have to run, and you're in this deep black are, and you have to run. And the field is burning, and the bull is coming to get you, and the, through the nostrils there's fire, and the mouth this big, and you're afraid. So we call that chemical dream, because your body chemistry got a little bit screwed up, and when you wake up in the middle of the night, it is, ah! then you have to get some medicine for indigestion, and then you sleep well. So we call that physically induced dreams. Because there's some chemistry going on. Also, if people drink a lot, they can have even bigger nightmares. And then they come back, and then they wake up. They vow never to do it again. The next one is something that you remember because your mind really didn't process it on that day. Like you had a real big conflict. You came to a Zen lecture. You asked a question. You didn't like the answer. You got up and left. And you dream with it. And in your dream, you want to stay, grab the stick of the Zen teacher, and hit him in the face with it. <laughs> so that's something that your mind didn't process because it didn't stay in the moment. It left and took this trauma of meeting a Zen teacher away, 
And then, in the dream, it comes back and you play the what-if game. What could have happened? It's something that you process, and sometimes you don't even remember it, and you let it go. And the third one is what we call indicative dreams. I don't want to say prophetic dreams or whatever special. They indicate something. That's why I call them indicative dreams. Now, this is just one clip. In linear time, sometimes just like 10 seconds. But if you look at it and you ask this question, what is this? Where does this come from? It becomes like a whole movie. And frame by frame, it has meaning. Frame by frame, it's connected to something that has been there for time immemorial because they seem totally timeless. So these are the dreams that actually repeat a few times if you don't act right upon them. And after a while, they stop. And if you listen, you change your life to the correct direction. And if you don't listen, you make your karma worse. This is actually coming from a very special state of mind, when it's not tied and bound during sleep time to the body. And when that happens, you can actually perceive karma and bring the message home. Now, most of the time, we don't believe this. But we can do this, because if you understand the nature of life on this earth, in this body, you know that sensory cause and effect, including its environment, three-dimensional space, and one-dimensional time exist as long as we are in this body with these instruments like brain and physical senses, etc. You don't have the body, you don't have three-dimensional space, and you do not have linear time. And that's why the perception can be different. The message comes, seems to be totally independent of you, but it was you who brought it. And then you have to see this very, very clearly, and that's when meditation practice is very useful. You put this before your mind mirror, and you do not analyze it. You do not willfully process it. You do not attract part of it and reject some other parts of it. You see it as it is. And if you perceive this long enough, then your mind mirror will reveal its causality, the function of that dream. Because in fact, this too is a dream, because it's coming and going. It is put together 24 frames a second by our cognition, emotion, physical senses, etc. But one is in the body right here, right now, and the other is in sleep time, doing something else. So your correct relationship to the dream is important. You have to understand the message correctly and then you can make the right decision. How do we take the right decisions? How do you make mistakes? It depends. <laughs> you should see how you make mistakes. It's actually way more concrete. It's way more direct. And reverse the process. So see cause and effect when you make a mistake and you feel, <gasps> that was bad. I got hurt. I hurt someone. I didn't do the right thing. I didn't say the right thing. So the outcome was eh, not good. See how that happened. Reverse the process. You're on the right track. Yes, I know that uh, we must become very clear and go to the space where the decision arises, where you know that that is that you must do. And I had this kind of experience. But in the same time, sometimes you have a very strong feeling that something is correct and then you do it and it's not. <laughs> you have to revise the feeling where it came from. Maybe it came from a little desire or a little anger or a little absolute notion of good and bad built in habitually. And when this habit force controls us, then we make the wrong decision and we don't know it yet. We just see the result. That's how we learn. But if you learn to develop new habits instead of the old ones and treat them in the same way, that's a problem. Rather, look at the old habits and change the relationship to them. Then you can use the old habits. It means well. to, to accept the old habits and let them be useful. Let them be useful, but not being used by the old habits. I have several students uh, who were alcoholics, seriously almost died. So once they realize what these habits are doing to them, then they went through the 12 steps. And some of them became AA instructors. 
and helpers. They know they are dependent more than anyone, but they don't drink. They use the dependence to help others who are also dependent, but those folks, the patients, the clients, have not learned to control the habit. Those who did, they are still dependent, but they can control it. Habits are not old or young, bad or good, but your relationship to those habits, that's what matters. You can play this with virtually anything, any human characteristics. Driving on the road, high speed, in a safe manner, no problem. Driving on the road with C4 behind your back into a military installation as a suicide bomber, not so good karma. But the driving is there. I uh, wanted to ask you if you have an, an idea about dreams that are coming true. Uh, it's like dreaming something, a uh, situation, or uh, I don't know uh, to explain. I right don't now. know is my job. Now you should you should know now, so that my don't know could help you. Okay. Don't remembering the dream, but after a while, uh, find myself in that um, space, in that uh, moment. And so then, you don't remember the dream, but you find yourself in that moment. So how do you know that it was in the dream? Because uh, after a while, I uh, started to remember that I've dreamt. This is and already called deja fight. vu. This is important. Okay. And, and uh, at first, uh, I I was little and I didn't know what to think about. But uh, for some time, it's um, happening a lot, and I know it's for the first time that I'm in that place, that moment with those people, or. So, I, it's not something I did uh, a month or uh, a year ago. It's for the first time. So, you, do you it's have any It's very insight? simple. If you observed my previous answer to the dream, the fourth is the indicative dream. Now, you can actually put that under your consciousness level, into your subconscious. It can be a decision. So, it's hidden from you because if you remembered it, you could change it. If you put it into the subconscious, it, it becomes instinctual, like a driver, like any archetype that you have. So, then the dream comes true, but you cannot see it before it actually happened, because you wanted that. And then it happens exactly as it was. But if you remembered, you could be afraid, you could be worried, you could want it too much, you would have some desire or anger, rejection, whatever, towards the dream. You want to prevent that. Our consciousness is interesting because that's the basis of our free will. Your free will can say yes or no. I want it, I don't want it. And then you want to prevent that, then you send the dream down to your subconscious, and step by step, it becomes instinctual decision. One by one, each element of the dream happens because it comes to the surface, it creates your life's space at that moment. And moment to moment, the dream subconsciously creates that reality around you. And then at some point, usually when it's over, when you finished it, then you say, whoops, I've seen this before. How do you define the idea of doing good to someone or to a group of people? This can be very relative and even in the example with someone trying to bomb a military, you gave an example with a bomb. Giving a bad, doing something bad to one person would relatively do good to the others in the idea that they will have more time to make their karma well in this life. How do you define doing simple. good? 
Doing good means happiness, harmony, etc. Doing bad means suffering, disasters, etc. Very simple. By killing a human being in order to save many, can you say which in this case is right or wrong? Because many will be saved and a few would would not. Actually, this is a very dangerous rational. So that's why I'm asking the, the question. I don't know if it's a good rational or bad rational, but what type of rational would be good? There is no good or bad rational here. You make a decision yourself. And then, for instance, if you were more than a year ago in Paris, in Bataclan, with a weapon, and you see that the terrorists you know, start shooting people en masse, and already dozens are dead, you could have fired the weapon that you had to disable one of those terrorists, or all of them. Then you take that karma upon yourself that you kill another human being to save others. It's your decision. It's not a good or bad rational. Okay? You might do that because you say that I want to save these people's lives at the cost of disabling or even killing one or more of those terrorists. So this is a clear situation, but there is no principle about this. In Zen we say, do not take any life. It's one of the basic five precepts. But in Zen we also say, know when the precepts are open and when they are closed. Now this is dangerous. If you break them for yourself, you go to hell, your internal hell. If you keep them for yourself, you can also be locked up in your own narcissistic ivory tower. If you consider all beings and the welfare and happiness of all beings, then you might be on the right track if your mind is clear enough. But if not, then your ideas control you. Then any kind of good rational or bad rational will control you. So my answer to this question is, that originally there is no good or bad rational, but there are clear or unclear minds. So if your mind is clear, you make the right decision. If your mind is not clear, you don't. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you tell us about uh, telepathy and how it works? I'm interested in this. I understood your question. That's already telepathy. Because you spoke, I heard it immediately my mind processed it, and I'm reflecting it back to you. That's what it. What about distance at distance? Distance means you use a mobile telephone. Without it? Well, without it, it's a little more difficult. But sometimes it happens. <laughs> Actually, when your karma with another person is very good, then your thinking and your individuality does not inhibit the connection, the original connection. And uh, if both of them are in this way, then they can feel each other from a distance. But I wouldn't make this so special. Sometimes we don't even connect to those people who are at the same time and same space as we are. That's why I said what I said. So connect to those who are directly here and now. Telepathy is the icing on the cake. I understand. Thank you. You said uh, you, you wouldn't make this so special when this kind of good karma, uh, good connection base. So um, why wouldn't you make this so it special? it hurts. G when good connection based no, on... No, when you make it special. <laughs> it's so natural that we, we actually forget about it. We have the visible wavelengths of our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, you know, body, etc. The five senses. But when you have thinking, that are not manifesting seemingly outside of your brain, but they actually connect to other entities, not just humans, sometimes animals too, and maybe other types of entities. And we forget the extension. We forget that we have other wavelengths, okay? Below infrared and above ultraviolet. So when you meditate, you can get used to this. In fact, I can tell you out of the experience of like, 90-day retreats, one after the other in the last 20 years and so, that um, when you sit next to somebody half a meter, meter, for 90 days without speaking any word, by the end of the third month, you feel, and the other also feels, that you guys know each other better than sometimes brothers and sisters. How does that happen? And there's no visible information passing. But when he or she starts to speak, it's already very familiar. And you never talked. 
You just sat next to each other for three months. That's it. So when you think your mind and the other minds are separate, and you cut off thinking, return to no time, no space, then your mind and other mind connected. Okay? Very simple. But we are not used to it. We are used to the noise. So that's why when we practice together, we keep silence. If you have the wall of the self, you are not connected. If you bring that wall down, or you open a great way, a door, a gate, through that wall, then there is connection. Decide what you want. And that's what will happen. Yes, I just wanted to ask you, basically, would you say that the road to enlightenment is detaching from all attachments because, in essence, I am no form? In essence, there is no I, originally. <laughs> but when you get enlightened, let's put it, you are something. Who said that? Both of us. Me and I. You have two? Me and I? Now speaking, yes. Only You're two. lucky. Some people have more. <laughs> but if you want to get enlightenment, even two are too many. So bring it down to one, then to zero. Then you attain this point. At this point, there is no I. No enlightenment, no suffering. Then you get something. More questions? Regarding the, the dream state, uh, it happens, it happened to me, I have a clear uh, conscious dream. Well, I'm, I know that I'm dreaming. So is some, somehow, <coughs> when I'm conscious that I'm dreaming, is, is there some kind of control? When you're consciously dreaming? That means you are perceiving your own dream in real time? Yeah, if you practice meditation correctly, there is control or dream yoga. Other than that, you just watch and sometimes you subject yourself to the dream itself. And if you identify with it, you're up the creek. That's how drugs operate. They put you into, into an altered state of consciousness with zero control. Dream yoga and meditation goes the other way. They put you back to reality and when the dream happens, then you are in control. It's different. So, some monks, they said that when uh, the dream starts to happen, there is an intensity when they wake up, you know, mentally, but the body is still sleeping. And if the dream is not so good, because it's some unfinished karma that is raising its ugly head like a dinosaur, then the mantra kicks in. And the mantra neutralizes the dream as a firewall would neutralize an intruder. So think about the dream as a long-term cause and effect. Like you throw away a boomerang, it takes a huge circle and comes back to you. But if it takes a lifetime or more lifetimes for the boomerang to come back, you don't remember when you threw it. You just see it coming back. When the cause and effect relationship comes to full circle, sometimes you can get hurt by your own karma, which you started before, but you don't remember. It seems to come from the outside. And when you kick this mantra on, if you practiced enough, it happens spontaneously, then you prevent your own mind against the harmful influence of your own karma. It still happens, but it doesn't hurt you because you stop identifying with it. That's how the firewall works. But if you have no practice, you have no control. You just watch it and sometimes you wake up all sweat, you know, or all trembling or cold or shaking because that's what your identification with the dream did to you. It's not your dream that does it. It's your relationship to the dream that does it. Is it clear? Yeah. Good. So when you change that relationship because you do not identify with it, then it comes and goes without a hindrance. That's what you do during meditation with a mantra or with a question or with just directly mind space perception. And then the dream behaves differently because you behave differently. You said something about a mantra. Yes, uh, I did. Using in a, that monks used in a dream. Nuns too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like that you pointed this. <laughs> uh, is it uh, 
mm, standard mantra or it's per standard pers mantras, extraordinary mantras, occasional mantras, permanent mantras, <laughs> round mantras, square mantras, long mantras, <laughs> short mantras. What would you like? You want a mantra? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kwan se umbosa. Kwan means perceive. Se is the world. Um is the sound. Bosal is bodhisattva. So the bodhisattva who perceives the sound of the world. In Sanskrit, Avalokiteshvara. In Tibetan, Chenrezig. In Japanese, Kanon or Kanzeon. Kanzeon Bosatsu. In Korean, Kwanseon Bosal. You repeat Kwanseon Bosal, your mind immediately goes towards the direction of compassion. It's compassion mantra. We all need that. So you say Kwanseon Bosal. So you drive, and before you scream at somebody behind the wheel, you say Kwan Sambosa, then scream. <laughs> okay? Very different. Your scream will be more compassionate. <laughs> You're welcome. I would like to sincerely appreciate your attention tonight. Thank you very much for having me here in Dimeshwara again after a short break. And I hope that we can practice together either tomorrow on or in any uh, other programs that we have announced on our homepage or Facebook. And I also appreciate that you pay attention to the videos and share it with others. So I hope we can practice together, become clear, and save this world and all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.